what a joy is to be in the presence of the Lord. Raise your hand. I'm glad. David says, I was glad when they said unto me, what? Let us go into the house of the Lord. Only the redeemed of the Lord shall go into the house of the Lord. Why? Because they are going to meet with the Lord. And I'm glad that you're all here to hear from God. When we sing songs, we are worshiping God. Right? When we are singing songs, we are worshiping. When we pray, it's a worship. When we give tithe and offering, it's a worship. But when the word of God is being preached, what's happening? God speaks to you. It's not man's voice that you want to hear. You want to hear the very voice of God. And so come before God with expectation. As pastor said, we want miracles in our life. But the greatest miracle that we can have is the miracle of regeneration. Where a dead person, a person who is dead to Christ, hears the word of God. And God works in his heart by the mighty operation of the Holy Spirit. And changes this dead man, spiritually dead man, into a live man for God. You saw the difference between Saul of Tarsus and Paul was changed. This is what happens when God intervenes in man's life. And so we are here not to hear my voice, my words, not my wisdom, but God's wisdom through us. And so shall we all rise to read Psalms 32? And uh, let's all read it together. Uh, a small group of people, so let's all read it together. Psalms 32. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, all together. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sins the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as the heat of summer. Then I acknowledge my sin to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you, while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble, and surround me of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous, seeing all you are upright in heart. Praise be to God. Heavenly Father, your word and your people, and I am yours, O Lord. Speak to us, O Lord. May your word accomplish what it has. It, it, it is for, O Lord. That your word may not be a judgment for us, but a great blessing to us, O Lord. Prepare our hearts to receive it, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall be seated. Praise the Lord. Another Psalm of David. Psalms 32. See, when I was meditating on God's word throughout scriptures, throughout Genesis, End of revelations, whenever we go through it, you know, our God is a very reasonable God. The whole Bible is full of reasons. God is giving man reasons after reasons. God of the Bible doesn't need to give us reasons. Why? Because He's all sovereign God. But what is He doing? This Almighty God, all knowing God, all powerful God, is reasoning with man from the very beginning. He reasons with man. And today's psalm, I would like to call it good news for all people. Good news for all, the saved and the unsaved. It is good news for all people. And God gives reason from Genesis onwards. He said, let us make man according to our own image and likeness. Why? The reason is that, that he may rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all beasts that he has created. God created man with a purpose that he may rule the nature that he has created. God gives many more reasons. He always gives reasons to man. Why? From very beginning. He says to Adam and Eve, you shall not eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. Why? The day you eat, you shall die. Does God have to give a reason? You know, why God has to give a reason? But he reasons with man. And so God of the Bible 
throughout history, throughout Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, all throughout the Bible, you will see God telling you something to do, and behind that there is a reason why he has, you have to do it. You know, the Bible, the key words of the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why did he give his only begotten son? Because he loves the world. See, a reasonable God giving reasons after reasons after reasons so that you and I may understand. He says, be holy, for I am holy. Why be holy? Why should you try to be holy? Why should you strive to be holy? Why? Because we want to dwell in the presence of the holy God. You, can, you cannot be unholy and come into the presence of God. So God is a reasonable God. And he has given us the Holy Bible, which is a reasonable book. And when people look into it, it's all nothing but reasons after reasons after reasons after reason why we should love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul and strength and why we should obey him. You see, see Adam and Eve committed sin. And if we ask them, hey, what was the sin that Adam and Eve committed? They committed a sin of disobedience. Correct? Well, that's right. But in that sin, in that tiny sin, they also committed rebellion against God. They rebelled against God. That sin in God's eyes. When you do not listen to God and listen to the devil, you're making the devil the master and you're rejecting God. You re they rejected God as the God in that one commandment. You see, there's defiance, there's pride. They want to be like God. So sin is a serious thing. One man asked a pastor, Pastor, why are you so serious about sin? Why do you always speak about sin? Because sin is a serious matter. The sin is what caused man to depart from the presence of God. One single sin. You may think it is a single sin, but when God looks at it, he sees a heart of pride. He sees a heart of defiance. He sees a heart of rebellion. And this is what God doesn't like. You need to wholeheartedly love the Lord. And here is a psalm, Psalm 32. It's called a mascal of David. And it says over here, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Throughout the Bible, we see many definitions of, 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 of being blessed. Many definitions. Psalms 1 starts with a, a definition of blessing, right? What is it? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Again, a definition of blessing. We just heard a definition of blessing from, I think, Nathan, who spoke from uh, Psalms 119, verse 1. Again, it starts with the word blessing. This is also a verse which starts with the definition of blessing. But I'll tell you one, brothers and sisters, this definition is the foundational definition of blessing. Every other blessing in the Bible is based upon this blessing. If you do not have this blessing, none of the blessings matter. You cannot meditate on God's word if this blessing of Psalms 32 is not true in you. It says what? Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. You and I are the redeemed of the Lord. The greatest miracle is the miracle of regeneration. Where a dead man, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God works in his heart, removes a hard heart and gives it a soft heart, a receptive heart. A receptive heart of God's word that he may receive it and he's overjoyed with. And only thing that he wants to do is he wants to give Thanks to the Lord, praise the Lord, and be obedient to God. That is a regenerated life. Paul, before he became Paul, the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus, an enemy of God. But on the way to Damascus, God with a mighty power approached him and reconverted him. And he, from an enemy, he became a child of God. Dear brothers and sisters, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. You and I are blessed for only one reason, that God has forgiven us our sins. Praise be to God. Do you believe that God has forgiven our sins? If you ask the people of this world, are you blessed? And they may, give, they may say that they are blessed, but their reasoning for blessing is all temporal. Everything in this world that they have, they may have a lot of money. They may have a lot of other wealth and riches. They may have power and position. But everything is temporary. It is, it is over here. It just vanishes. It is like, like flakes, snowflakes. It comes down. It is there for a moment and it is gone. 
But this blessing that God says, it is not just a blessing for this world, but also a world to come. Hallelujah. It is an eternal blessing. And so you and I should be very thankful to God that we are saved people of God. Our sins, our transgressions have been forgiven. Have our sins have been covered. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, there are so much things coming into my mind, but I do not know where to start. You know, this is this psalm as a reference to 2 Samuel chapter 11. This psalm is written by David after God forgave him for the sin that he committed. He one day, 2 Samuel chapter 11, it says, when the time where the kings had to go to war during the springtime, Kings don't sit in their palace, they go for war. It was their job. But this time, David being a very powerful king, he stayed at home. He sent his army and they are fighting the enemies. But while he was walking on the terrace, on the, on the rooftop of his palace, he saw a woman bathing. What happened? We know the story. He lusted, he inquired, he lusted, he brought her in, committed adultery, and then tried to hide it and tried to Try to, try to put it on his wife, his her husband. Then nothing worked out. He conspired and then he committed murder. This was a low point, spiritually low point in the life of David. And he thought nobody knows this. He's a powerful king. Nobody is going to question him. But in the last verse of chapter 2, verse 11 of 2 Samuel, it says, it displeased God. God who watches over everybody. It says that God was displeased with what he did. Right? And so he thought nobody knows about it and he kept it hidden inside it. There was a sin that he committed. Nobody knew about it. He went on living his life. I do not know even Beersheba, the wife of Uriah that he married later on, even she knew what he did. It was all so hidden. But your sins are bare before God. God knows it. And what happened over here in verse 3, we see this. It says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. A true child of God, if you are born again, the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sin. You may have done things in, 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 in secret. You may have done things that people doesn't know. You may think that people doesn't know it. But you have to stand before God. You cannot hide from his presence. We know the stories. Jonah tried to hide. He tried to hide far away. He tried to run away to Tarshish far away. He thought God is not watching him. But God watches everything. Even when he was in the depth of the sea, God was with him. You cannot run away from God. If you try to run away from God, you are running towards him. Coro Dio. Uh, Coram Dio, which means right into the face of God. Um, you cannot hide from his presence. He is everywhere. Go to the depths of the sea, he is there. So whatever you thought, whatever you think, whatever secret sins that you're committing, it will, God, God knows about it. And the good part of it is that when we sin against God, when we sin against God, God gives you the gift of repentance. He should convict you. He should convict me. When we sin against God, it is not that we, 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 we sin and we hide about it, but God's, God's Holy Spirit will convict you. The conviction is required. It is the Holy Spirit speaking to you and making you feel very unhappy, very sad. Over here it says, For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Right? My, my, my God's hand, his energy was sapped. What is happening? What's bothering him? The guilt. That he committed a sin. Nobody knew about it. But only God knew about it. And he knew it. And God was always convicting. See, whenever you have this conviction, the only way to get out of this conviction is to ask for forgiveness. When you ask for forgiveness, that burden, the guilt of sin goes away. The greatest burden that a person can have is not a financial burden. It's not a health burden. The greatest burden that a person carries on in his life is the guilt of sin. He had done something very unjust. He might have sinned against somebody. All throughout his life, God will bother him. 
His spirit within him, his conscience within him will keep on bothering him. Why? It is God's grace coming to you saying that you do not have peace inside you because you have sinned against God and you have lost your peace with God and there is no peace within you. But how can peace come to you? Peace can come only to you when you repent truly of your sin. Hallelujah. You know, over here in verse 5 it says, I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquities. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sins. First and foremost, when David committed this sin, he thought nobody's watching him. But God in his sovereign will, in his providence, sent the, the prophet Nathan and said, you are the man who committed this sin. And when the man of God approached, David surrendered his life and he prayed to God. This chapter 32 also is, is, is referencing chapter 51 where David really prayed. See, when I acknowledge my sin, you know, most of us, when we say, when we pray, God forgive us of our sins, it's a one-liner. God forgive me my sin. No. See, God doesn't just want your words. He sees your heart. You know, and look at, when you go home, look at Psalms 51. And over there you will see how David is praying for the forgiveness of sin to God. It is not one or two words, it's a long chapter. But every word you can see the heart, the ache, the pain that David is having in his heart for the sin that he committed and he's asking God to forgive his sin. Dear brothers and sisters, this is what we need to have. We need to have a conviction within us. We need to say, Lord, take away this guilt of sin that I'm carrying on. Because your prayers are not very strong enough, your prayers are not convincing, you still continue to gather that, that guilt. You still continue to continue that burden of guilt in our life. But if you pray like David, like Psalms 51, read it, understand it. And when God forgives your sin, then you will be able to read Psalms 32, which over here, David is rejoicing when he starts, the greatest joy that I can have is not my riches, it is not my army, it is not my position as a king, but the greatest blessing is that God has forgiven my transgressions. The sin are of two kinds. We call sin iniquities. And there are some places called transgression. What is iniquity? Iniquities are the sins that we commit in our mind, in our hearts. We do not talk about it, we do not act upon it, but it is a sin that we commit by thinking bad things, bad thoughts, hatred, right, lusting, deception, all these things when we think about in our in our mind, God watches it and it is a sin against God. But transgression is something that you act upon. When you act upon, you're transgressing God's law. See, in the in this world, when we live in this world, you can think whatever you want. There's no punishment for it. You can speak bad things from your mouth. You can say many bad things. But that is not considered a violation of any law. But when you act upon something, like you kill somebody, if you say, I'm going to kill you, it is not a violation. Nothing is going to happen. But the moment you act upon that, that, that action, the word, that is the time the law of the land comes after you, right? You will be arrested. You will be prosecuted. But in God's eyes, even a thought, a sinful thought, is considered sin. What happened to Lucifer? He did not act. He just thought about a sinful thought that he wants to be as God. And God saw that and God punished him. You see, even a thought that comes into our mind, God can judge you for that. And over here, he's saying, the greatest blessing that I have is when I acknowledge my sin and did not cover up. That's where the blessing comes. Yes, we are humans. We will sin. We may commit grievous sins in our life. But praise God for the conviction that God gives us. And when the conviction comes, acknowledge your sin. Do not debate. Do not rebel. Do not, do not put the blame on somebody else. Adam said, this woman that you gave me, he, she's the one who gave me the fruit. And uh, the serpent and all other reasons. But that is not acknowledging sin. That is just passing the bug on somebody else, somebody else's problem, I should not be taking. If that is our demeanor, that is our way of giving excuses, there will be no forgiveness of sins. We may gossip against other people, we may conspire, we may, we may talk bad things about people behind the back, but when God convicts you, ask for forgiveness. Praise God. There's a way out when you sin. It says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful. It's his promise. When God, when you say, when you sin against God, if you confess truly of our sins and not conceal our sins, Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals your sin does not prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. You have a choice to make, brothers and sisters. You can conceal your sin or you can reveal it to God and say, God, take her away, forgive me my sins. And God is faithful and just because he has promised and he is a covenant keeping promise, promise keeping God. He will forgive because he said it and he will surely do it. Therefore, it says in the Bible, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Throughout the Bible, God is giving us reasons after reasons after reasons. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. What do we need? We need God's forgiveness. One sin was enough for Adam and Eve to be thrown from the presence of God. Why? Because by the introduction of sin in their life, they became unholy people. How can an unholy people, unholy person live in the presence of the holy God? God had to banish. But you know that it's a God is a loving God. He's a God who is compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, the Bible says. Even at the moment where Adam and Eve was casted away from his presence from the Garden of Eden, he did one good thing. God, because he had mercy upon those people, he killed an animal, took the, uh, took the, uh, the, the leather or the, or the or skin of the animal and clothed Adam, Adam and Eve because they were clothless. They didn't have any clothes. And so God covered. You see how God is? God is a compassionate God. That's why God saw man has no hope. And so God created for us a way to come into his presence. Hallelujah. Then I acknowledged my sin and did not cover up. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And he forgave the guilt of my sins. The guilt of sin will weigh you down. Will weigh you down. It is a big burden that people carry. But there's a way out. What? I acknowledge my sin before go before the throne of grace and say, God, forgive me for my sins. Now it says over your verse 6, Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Hallelujah. He's always there. The Bible says, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. And the greatest thing that we need to ask is, God, wash me and cleanse me. I don't want money. I don't want riches. I don't want anything. I want more of you, oh God. More of you. Give me more of love for you. Give me more desire for your word. You know, that's what we need to pray. Stop praying for all things of this world. Inanimate objects. All these things that we pray for, it is just temporal. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That means God's kingdom must be within us. Kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Practice righteousness. Be holy. And God will give you everything that you needed in this world. King Solomon, when God asked him, what do you want? Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom so that I can raise, I can, I can, I can, I can manage this people, this, 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 this kingdom that you have given me. God says, because you did not ask for other things, but you asked for wisdom, you shall receive everything along with it. What we need is wisdom. What we need is more of God. What we need, need is more holiness in our life. What is holy? Nothing but living a righteous life. Righteous eyes, uh, life in whose eyes? In God's eyes. You live every single day righteously in God's eyes. And that is holy living, a separated living. God has called you to be a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation to the Lord. Be holy, for I am holy. Without holiness, no one sees God, the Bible says. Only the pure in heart will see God. Matthew chapter 5 again has a bunch of definition that talks about blessed people, blessed people, blessed people. But again, all those blessings is, 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 is founded on this one blessing that Psalm 32 talks about, where transgressions have to forgiven. If our sins are not forgiven, if our transgressions are no, not forgiven, all other blessings have no foundation. It cannot never happen. And now over here, verse 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you must go. I will counsel you with my loving eyes on you. You see, 
we don't want human wisdom we want god's wisdom very smart people out there making smart decisions but we want godly wisdom making godly decisions bible says do not lean on to your own understanding correct do not lean on to your own understanding um, yeah i can i can remember the words but proverbs do not lean on to your own understanding why because our understanding a flawed understanding but we need the wisdom of god right we need to have the wisdom of god teach me the teach me lord the ways of of your decrees that i may follow you psalm 119 verse 30 is give me understanding so that i may keep your law and obey it with all my heart direct me in the path of your command for there i find delight our delight should be in the law of the lord you know our delight should be in the law of the lord i will instruct you and teach you god is given us this holy bible with all sorts of instruction it is for us that we may read it understand it and live by it see we do not have excuses before god if we are not living according to god's will we can't give excuses to god because god has given us an instruction an instruction book how we should live this book tells us how we should live and if you ignore this book and do things our way then god is it is not god's problem it is our problem he has revealed to us i will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go i will counsel you with my loving eyes on you do not be like a horse or a mule which have no understanding you know god gives reason after reason after reason but people just keep ignoring these reasons he told the israelites i will be your god and you shall be my people but after all these blessings israel received he still they still wanted to be like other nations they wanted to be like other nations they wanted to leave their god they want another god and so what happened the blessing that god pronounced upon israel the blessing did not fall but all the curses that he said is going to happen if you do not walk in my ways those things happen dear brothers and sisters we have given a book an instruction book which we have to read understand and live by it then only we shall be blessed hallelujah many are the woes of the wicked verse ten for the lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him rejoice in the lord and be glad righteous sing all you are upright in heart you see brothers and sisters we can rejoice only when we live uprightly before god otherwise there will always be guilt of sin we can walk around doing many things but we'll be always our energy will be sapped when David acknowledged his sin. God took away the guilt. The joy came back. The peace of God that transcends all human understanding will guard your heart and mind. See, so you got to have peace with God, and then then you shall have peace in you, right, Pastor? Peace in you and peace with God. When sin gets into our life, we lose peace with God. We become enemies of God. Brothers and sisters, you are hearing me talk. This is a, a similar situation that we can also be. we may not commit a grievous sin like david committed but we sin every day and god's holy spirit convicts us of our sins it may not do be during the daytime but in the middle of the night when you're sleeping when you are convicted by confronted by god by the holy spirit and you are told that you have sinned all that you have to do is ask for forgiveness of your sins immediately there ask for forgiveness of the sins and if you have sinned against a person go to that person also and ask for forgiveness that's how you shall receive the peace of god within you david sent but god with the function of the holy spirit sending a prophet spoke the word and he repented he could have put nathan into death he could have he could have sent prophet nathan for talking against the king like this he could have declared that sentence on him but what did david do he repented dear brothers and sisters when a pastor when a brother even when a young sister or a brother comes and tells you about your sin to you would you fight against him or her would you rebel against god's word god who used the donkey to speak god could use stammering moses to speak god could use uneducated stephen to speak the word of god it is not the person but the word that's coming to us it could be through god and so when let us surrender our lives when the word of the lord is preached from the pulpit do not just hear it and leave it it will be of no benefit hear it receive it act upon it live by it and then you shall receive blessing dear brothers and sisters 
Psalm 32, it's a psalm of David, but a psalm that God has given it to us. It is applicable to our lives as well. So with that, I would like to conclude. Praise the Lord.